I've set myself a challenge to restore a tractor, something I have never done before. Now I just need to find it. <laughs> oi, oi, this looks promising. Or not. <laughs> whether to be pleased or scared. Whoa. So with no mechanical experience whatsoever, why am I doing this? I moved to the country just over a year ago and I was amazed at the sheer volume of people who have classic tractors and have such enthusiasm for this hobby. And I thought, why can't I be part of that? I've chosen a real classic, a Massey Ferguson 135. Now, it's fair enough to say I do not know that much about tractors, but I'd say this is in a pretty bad state. That's my um, initial opinion. But then, of course, what's the point in buying a tractor with minimal work to do? If I'm going to take this on, I might as well go with a whole hog and do it right. Now all I need is to get it moved, so I've called on my mate Eugene. Luckily, he's come well prepared. That should get us started, hopefully. I have a feeling that this will not be the only time I'm getting my hands dirty over the next few weeks. Okay. I get a lesson in priming the engine. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so big. Oh, she sounds grand. Mightn't look it, but sounds it. Brilliant. I might look dead pleased with myself, but in reality, I don't really have a clue about the enormity of the task I've taken on. So what have I bought? And is it really feasible to restore it? I enlist the help of tractor expert Wilbert Crawford, who I'm sure will put my mind at rest. Or not. Why is he so quiet? Oh. Hope you have a good big purse. You're going to have to spend a bit of money on that thing. Oh gosh, don't depress okay. me. That, that there's upside down for a start. Okay. This wee ridge should be down this way. Somebody had this off at one stage and put it on upside down. And go around and look at this from here, this yeah. side. That there is the smooth sides up. There's no rib. And the I, rib's down in there. I must admit, I wouldn't so, even notice so that type of thing. But it doesn't affect how the tractor actually operates, no, it does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make any difference here, but as cosmetic as the look of the thing. And obviously it's all about looks. <laughs> it does, uh-huh. Right. There's a wee bit of a shake wear in that front bearing. There's a there's a bearing out on the outside, yep. there's a bearing on the inside. They're not a, they're not very expensive, but for safety's sake, you you better replace them. These bolts here in the front axle, a long one, a shorter one. And then another lesson here is even shorter again. There's three different lengths. Yeah. Those shouldn't be. Those should always be the same length. They're, they're, uh, they're maybe they do the job all right, but they don't look good. They should be all the same length. That they should be all the same length. Why are they like that now? Somebody put those in. Just uh, they hadn't the proper ones. To, 
And he put that and never changed it, whoever had it. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing I here. I need your advice, but mm -hmm. there's obviously other people out mm -hmm. there who oh, start these things and, uh -huh. and don't quite know how to do, do it just same. so. Oh, the foot plates, they're, they're quite good. They, they just, I think they just need tightened up. Uh, you know, it's quite, it's quite good. They're not, they're a good grip and all on when you're getting on and off. There's quite a good grip there. The dash is a bit tatty looking. We don't Bringing, want tatty. It's just not a mm. great base to, to work on. You see, you see a light of that there's at the pit up there as well. So it's, and you, you would, you could spend a lot yeah. of time and, and money on that and still not come up to, to scratch. So you just better replace that there. Yeah. Maybe a good second hand one. You might get somewhere. Uh, some of the breakers or something like that there. The steering wheel. You need to replace that. That's badly worn. You see up yeah. there. Uh -huh. That's badly worn there, and that would that'd be sore in your hands if you're doing a lot of driving all day. Yeah. And, so, and so I, if I'm out in the road doing my handbrake turns, yeah. you don't you, you use your handbrake for the, doing the turns. You use your foot brake. <laughs> you get a better I response. I can't believe I'm the, totally the, joking, and you're like serious. The, the foot, you see the foot brake. The, uh -huh. There's two pedals there. You can you can lock them together mm -hmm. to <laughs> break both wheels. But if you're doing a sharp turn, you just you, you, you keep them separate and then you press one and that brings her around. You can swing around, do a handbrake turn with that. I can't believe foot. I've just been given a tip on mm. how to do donuts in a tractor. Do, do, do yes. Do. yes, love it. <laughs> you move that back yep. slowly and you can see the wear. There's wear in there and there's wear in there and that one there. So you'd have to replace those two, two track rod ends. They call those. You can see, see the wear on it. So you can, that's, but definitely that needs replaced, those oh two. Yeah. This mud guard or mud wing, if you call them, they, they, it's a twist over this way. Yeah. Now whether you could straighten it up or not, I don't know. You need to, you see, it's, it's quite rocky there, all oh that. Oh gosh, that see looks uh -huh. a bit dodgy. Uh -huh. mm. You've got a bit of rust, we have heavy rust on there, it's, it's actually rusted through. Now that, I would replace that mud guard completely. Although, if it's original, is that not good to have? Really, it all depends when you take it off and see how badly that there is rusted through or eaten through. But that, if that there can be a, a new bit set in there, yeah. and that there, you can you can save it. So you, you weigh could, up the cost you, of you salvaging could, uh -huh, it and, uh, and uh, keep and it the, an original piece. And the safety aspect at the same time. Of course. So, uh -huh, so oh, there's so many decisions to be made uh -huh. about everything. This here is original on uh -huh. these, the, these earlier 135s. The later models hadn't got this. It was just a, a, a tin thing here, metal thing yeah. down here. So that's original, but you can still put that on your new mud oh, guard. Oh, so we can keep this yeah, bit? You can keep oh, that bit. Oh, that's good. That, at least uh -huh. we can uh -huh. you salvage can, you, something. You can have that, you can keep that there. The original tail lights were made by Butler. They're, those aren't Butler there, those, those are spurious or some of them make but uh, still you can get them I'll be able to source you're that able to source those yeah brilliant but now when you the more you look at it it doesn't get any better looking no <laughs> it doesn't we'll check this pto shaft we have to start the we have to start the tractor okay. to check that and uh, i'll i'll start it up here and see what When I, when I put down the clutch pedal, yeah. that there should stop. Okay. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's, it's, not it's, stopping. it's not stopping. That's another problem, I'm guessing. That's another problem, and, and some more money. It's, it's, um, that, that should stop, stop dead. So. I'm guessing that's going to be a real problem. If somebody is standing there when that there is running, that shaft's going. If their clothes get the leg of the trousers, say if they're reaching over the tractor there at the back, the, 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 the PTO shaft just catches your trousers and it just oh. could leave you standing your underpants just <laughs> and, in, a, and in a very short time. So it could be pretty dangerous. And that would be, that'd be one of the least things we could do. It's a very fatal, a terrible lot of people get killed with those PTO oh gosh, shafts. So that really mm -hmm. is something I need to, uh -huh, I need uh -huh, to uh -huh. fix. Uh -huh. And, and what's, you're, you're going to be the bearer of more good news. What do I need to do then to fix it? You have to split the tractor. You split it around here at the front. You split that and bring out the clutch. And then, yeah, you maybe have to replace this. There's two plates in it, what they call clutch plates. Uh -huh. And you have to maybe replace them. Wilbert, I'm going to have to split the tractor. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't sound like it's going to be an easy job. That's not a major job, but it's, it's well, just one of those <laughs> things you have to do. This here, this here is... is there's a lot of wear here. The wear on that there, 
There's quite a bit of wear in that. that. That shouldn't be moving up and down like that there. There's quite a bit of that. And then there's wear on the shaft as well. And at the back, quite a bit of wear in that. Yeah. See that there, quite a bit of wear in that. that there's quite a bit of wear in that as well. That's it. That's just where you put the oil in. Mm -hmm. If the engine's worn, it should be blowing smoke out of there. Mm -hmm. if, if the engine is good, very little air comes out of it at all. Okay, so, so we don't want smoke. You don't want smoke. Fingers no, crossed. No smoking. No smoking. Oh, it's bad for your health. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm keeping so my fingers we'll, we'll crossed. Start, we'll start her up and in here, see what happens. <laughs> I'm going to get a bit technical now and test the hydraulics on my baby. When I pull back this lever, you should hear a slight change in the tune and the sound of the engine, and that means we have good hydraulics. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> I know. You That's could good. hear the, ch the slight change in the engine. The that was good. That means they're, they're pumping up good pressure. So. Another positive. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, oh. So you're saving a lot of money on the engine and the hydraulics. And I, I can stick to looks. That's obviously what yes. I'm good at. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. you know? Well, you have a good look yourself. You have to. Oh, oh thank, you, thank you. Gosh, <laughs> I was fishing for that compliment for quite a while. It was a long time coming. <laughs> when we were young and went to a dance hall, yeah, and, I'm, and you, you looked at the girl's face was the first thing you looked at. They were all sitting with their backs to the wall, you see, and all you saw there was a face. So you always tried to pick out as good a one as you could, as good looking a girl as you could get. Same with a tractor. When anybody is looking at a tractor, they come to the front. They look at it from the front. You need to look well and to get the attention. at the moment is like a toothless wonder. Yes. She's no yes. teeth with the no and lights, the no, no, no front lights, grill. No front grill. But those, that, if you put a new bonnet on that and a new front on it, it makes a new job. Just can transform the whole thing. Even though we know it's what's mm. inside that counts. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, definitely. I know she mightn't look the best, but as Wilbert's confirmed, all the basics are there and she does have a good heart. I think it's going to take a lot of hard work, but don't worry, we'll not let you down. Time for the overalls. This tractor is 45 years old, so it's been around a bit. Now you can see down here, somebody's tried to hand paint it. We know this is not the original grey, and I have to say, they didn't do a very good job. Now on the wheel here, you can see they've even painted it grey as well, over this original red. They should never have done that. Now if we're going to try and restore this back to its original glory, we're going to do it right. So we want to get the wheels back to the original red. <laughs> This is where the facelift begins. I can use a steam cleaner, I can even use a ratchet, but if this is going to happen, I'm going to need some help from expert tractor restoring enthusiasts, first of which is Eugene. Oh, God. So we start to dismantle the tin work. With the bonnet, you need to locate two well-hidden bolts. Give them four turns each, and then it should slip off. Ah, uh, yes, ah, there we go. Starting to. More turns near there. Oh. Three, two, one. And you're pushing forward at the same time. Lovely. Just cut. Oh right, leave it down. Leave it down the back. That's ah, you. Lovely. lovely. Right. Okay. There you go. That's right. Okay. Next, we take the battery out because any electrical shorts could cause sparks and that could lead to a fire. We're going to take the wing off, but to do so, it's going to be easier to take the wheel off first. So I'm going to use this socket and bar. No, I'm not. <laughs> Who would have thought fixing up a tractor would be quite so much fun? Okay, let's lay it 
off. That's lovely. Uh. I had a discussion with Wilbur about whether this wing was salvageable, and as you strip the tractor down, you get a far better idea on the different condition of parts. Eugene, what do you reckon? Well, it's, it's seen many years of abuse. There's, it's showing some rust, some corrosion. There's a few dents and bumps around it. You know, it's, it's pretty sound. There's, there's some rust about and some, yeah. uh, some corrosion. But I think, I think that it's fixable. Well, I think we should fix it because it will make the tractor much more valuable if it keeps its original wings. Cool. Great. Now, of course, we'll have the wheel off so I can get at this nut. Yep. This is my first restoration, so I'm really lucky to have access to Eugene's well-equipped workshop and therefore always having the right tool to hand. This screw probably hasn't been turned for decades. For this job, you need the right tools. One impact driver. Whoa, that was easy. Right, so the brake drum, what are we doing now? Well, we're trying to get the brake drum off so that we can examine the, the brake shoes. Uh -huh. that's, it's been on for years. Now, we don't want to use the hammer against the metal because it could damage it. And what I normally do is I just get a piece of timber, I put behind it and go mm -hmm. gently around each, each quarter. Oh, all the way all around. All the way around. So, so it comes off nice evenly. and evenly. Otherwise, it will stick and it's starting to get loose. It's starting to get this now, mm -hmm. so we can hopefully persuade it to come off. Nice and even, nice even pressure. Yep. And there it is. Okay, we can see there's, there's lots of cobwebs and dust inside this brake assembly. And what we're really interested in here, firstly, is the condition of the brake shoes. The lining is attached to the brake shoe with these rivets. Mm -hmm. And if we pick out some dust, you'll see that there well worn down, very, very close to the rivet, so it's worn right down to almost the rivet head. Mm -hmm. As well as that, we can see that the linings themselves are scored and they're, they're really past their best. Now, this is a vintage tractor and you may get away with just using these linings, but I think, I think we should replace them. We want to do this right, so I reckon change them then, yeah? Brakes are important. I think we should put on new yeah. brake linings. Defo. Okay. Now, we're looking here at an oil leak on the bottom side of the hub caused by a worn oil seal around the half shaft and uh, that's causing oil to get into the braking system. The oil seeps into the brake system, onto the brake linings, makes them very, very smooth. It loses its friction and it loses its efficiency. Mm. So we, we need to fix that. Okay. What I'm fast beginning to learn is that there is a lot of wear on moving parts in an old tractor. Now, Wilbert told me that there was wear on these track rod ends. And then I can actually feel the wear on these wheel bearings. And I can see the wear on this spindle shaft. And in fact, actually, when I lift the wheel, you can see it even better just in there. Oh, so now I know what the problem is. How do I fix it? the problem of wear, we must remove the track rod ends. Okay. Okay, we take off this nut. This is a special tool for taking off the track rod end. Put it in here. Hit a good sharp crack with the hammer. And there it's off. Next to come off are the wheel bearings. And to do that, remove the hub cap yep. from the hub. 
We clean the grease of that. And you can see here, there's a split pin that locks the castellated nut. The reason we call it a castellated nut is because there's these little pieces cut out of each face, mm -hmm. okay, and that holds the split pin and keeps the whole thing tight. And we can tap that out. It's fiddly, isn't it? It is fiddly, it's quite fiddly. Mm. And now pull out the pin. Okay, I'll try and bring all this out together in one piece so we can leave it here and examine it. First, we lift out the washer and you can see there's an extrusion here on the inside of the washer. That corresponds with the slot on the shaft. So when the washer's fitted, it can't rotate and the whole thing can be held nice and tight. Brilliant. Then, we take out the outer bearing and we give it a quick clean. So is that what's causing all the wear? Well, that's part of the problem. That, that bearing's worn. You can actually feel the wear. It's like feeling a roughness when you turn the inner part of the bearing against the, the rollers here. So there's, there's some wear in this bearing, and really, it's, it's, it's better if it's replaced. Yeah. OK, so now we've taken most of the grease out of the inside of the hub. Yeah. We're going to turn it over and remove the inner bearing, and hopefully it should fall out easy. And there it comes. So we've got the, first of all, the seal, and that's in pretty nasty shape. Definitely need replaced. Oh, yeah. And again, we'll give the bearing a little clean and have a look at it. And it doesn't look very healthy to me. No, it looks bad, It's Jackson. worse than the other one. <laughs> yeah. And you can actually feel the roughness when you move the inner part against the rollers. Yep. Yeah, totally. Nasty. It's rough. <laughs> so this needs replaced as well. Yeah, that's yeah. part of the set that we're going to buy for the the front wheel. Okay, we've, we've removed the wheel bearings. Uh, we're now going to take the spindle arm from mm -hmm. the spindle shaft and hopefully the spindle shaft will drop down out of the housing and then we can have a look at it. We'll take the nut off and here's one for your little box. The nut and the spring washer. Okay. Thank you. And then out comes it. The stud's quite tight but yeah, it's coming. Okay. And there's the stud. And you can see that's been there for a year or two and you look at all the, the oh rust yeah. all around the thread, so that Cheers. goes back into the little box. So if we take a, an old screwdriver, we put it in the slot here and we give it a, a tap or two like this. And we can see, right, you can see the, the clamp just starting to open and thing, right. things starting to loosen. Now what, what I also do here is I'll just give this a tap on the face. And if you look carefully, you'll see the spindle arm yeah. starting to fall down. Just a nice gentle tap. Not, not too hard, not too hard. Yeah. Gently does it all the time. Okay. And let's turn it around a little bit here and we'll go. See? Stop a minute now, we can see here with a little seal here to keep all the dirt out. Mm -hmm. This is the Woodruff key, it's a little square key, yeah. which keys the spindle arm to the spindle shaft and keeps the two of them moving together. Okay, so we'll just tap it on and off, it's going to fall out, hopefully. There we are. Uh. Just let me see it. Oh, lovely. Brilliant. Spindle arm. And, you know, it looks initially to be in, in fairly good condition in here. Yeah. Okay. Just hold the, the shaft up, up there so that I can try and get this key out, okay? Mm -hmm. That's it. I think it's going to come out. Now, there it is. Yay. And there's our Woodruff key. Yay. Will we have to replace this or does that go back in? No, we can use this again. This was in good condition. It hasn't been damaged, so we can use that one again. We'll just good. give it a good clean. Now, the spindle shaft should fall down nice and gently onto the floor, and then we can have a, a, good, a good look at it. Here we go. There's some water coming out there. Not a good sign. So there's your spindle shaft. So what we'll do... We'll give it a bit of a clean and we'll have a look at it and see what, what needs to be done. 
well, obviously, I know what's wrong with it. We just need to... <laughs> we need to open. What do we need to do? I guess what's wrong is this is the thrust bearing. Mm -hmm. And there's movement there. Now, that's the movement you saw earlier yeah. when you examined it. So take that bearing off gently. Just easy. That's ah. it. Take it off. Right off the top. And give it a clean. Give it a clean and, and give me your assessment of it. Okay. Hold on. I'll see. Is it... Yeah, just turn the inside and just see if you feel even movement. Uh, feel no, rough. that feels quite rough. There's something wrong there. There's, yeah, it's not smooth at all. Yeah, okay. So that's another new part. So you're talking about eight parts in total for this one side and presumably about another eight parts if you count seals and bearings for the other side. I mean, is that normal? Oh, yes, that's normal. <laughs> it, that's, that's what we need to put this thing right. Uh, you know, if we, if we do that, we leave this steering like new. Brilliant. Really okay, well that's what I want. Okay. So that's that's what you want. Perfect. Now, when you're restoring a tractor, it is brilliant to have a great range of sockets and spanners, and even toys like this air wrench. But I can tell you that two of the most important bits of equipment you should have are a clear plastic box and a marker, so that you can record and store as you go along. Because then, when you go to put it back together, it's going to make it much easier to find all the small bolts and bits and pieces. And it is essential to take photographs before and during this entire process so that when you go to put it all back together, you have a reference. Right, Molly? <laughs> Eugene has sent me in an errand for some spare parts, and of course I know exactly what I'm talking about. Hi there. Hello. I'm after a brake lining, spindle bearings, front hub bearings, and an oil seal for a rear half shaft, and I need an inner and outer. Thank you very much. <laughs> and what is it for? What's the model? It's a 135. 135, right. Can you tell me, has it a bent axle or a straight axle? Oh, I was trying to act like I knew what I was talking about there, and you just you've you've fobbed me off at the first one. Oh. Do you know what? I've taken some photographs of the tractor. Maybe you have a picture of the axle. Oh would that right, that would Hold help on. a lot. Um, there's a picture. No, next one, next one. Oh, that right, yeah, it's a bent axle. Cool, there. brilliant. Thank Great. you. If every customer was like that, it would make our job easier. Now, I was sent up here to an independent by Eugene because as somebody starting out, you know, I've never done this before. In fact, like lots of people starting out, I think building up that relationship and having that personal touch yeah. because yeah. then I'm not going to feel really stupid if I'm asking for what's this part do you know, what's this bit, yes. that type of thing, you know? Yeah. Oh, I know, I know rightly where you're coming from. Uh, but it's just, it's the problem that people tend to be very smart and you get know-alls out there who think they know it all. Then they put the customer under pressure. Yep. The customer then doesn't know what to ask for. And sometimes he's, he's rushed out of a shop and he doesn't, he's gone home with half the stuff. But usually if you have a good manner with somebody, a customer will keep coming back to you. And, and that's the secret. Absolutely. I mean, guys like yourselves, I think, you know, there are a lot of people and they're new to this game, you know, like myself. And yeah. it, it removes the embarrassment factor, I think, as well. You know, if I, I'm not really sure what I'm talking about, but... I, you know, you guys can then explain what I need, you know, oh, and you also should get this part because it will help you down the line. Exactly. I recognise this part because we've just removed it from the tractor. Yes. That's the bearing, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now, the only other thing, I mean, you might need is there's a bushing goes along with this mm -hmm. for the spindle. If there's wear in the spindle, you would need to replace that. But now, if we can get a bush in there, we'll show you, you should replace the bushings along okay. with the bearings and try that. While David's away getting that, well, how's things going in the restoration? Are you, oh. Is this your first time? Or? It is, total first time, and it's, it's such a slow process. You need so, thank you, you need so much patience with it. You know, my learning curve is like this at the moment. I'm just gradually working my way through it, and it is, it's enjoyable, and I'm, I'm loving putting the effort and time into something yeah. that, you know, hopefully will be just spot on at the oh end. Right, well, it's, you would need to be enjoying it because it's one of those things that is slow to build yeah. up. And there'll be many a night you'll be saying just, oh, I wish I could get rid of this and, <laughs> and be done with it. But if you do love it and you do have the interest in it, uh, it's a great pleasure at the end of the day because whenever you have the thing finished, it's sitting there nicely painted up, sitting shining and driving like a sweetie. You just, <laughs> you just think it was all worthwhile. <laughs> I'm just 
going to remove the steering wheel here. I just have to take the uh, dome head nut off and then lift it off. Really easy. I've heard people taking a hammer to it. I've even allegedly heard that people have tried to use a forklift truck. But it's not easy. It's never going to be easy. And if you don't do it properly, you could do some serious damage. Unless, of course, you have a very clever idea like our Eugene here, who has improvised using a puller and a chain. How does this work? Well, it's important to draw off the steering wheel and the line with the shaft, which is an, an angle to the vertical. You don't want to damage it. You don't so want to damage anything, be, yeah. so it's got to come off at this angle. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've, we've wrapped a chain around the spokes of the steering wheel, we've presented the puller to the chain, yep. attached the two together, and now you're going to screw the top and lift the steering wheel straight off the shaft. Okay. Okay, I'll steady it for you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Get it going. That's Thanks. it. Yes, keep it going. It's getting tight, isn't it? Steady does it. That's Ooh. it. You can see how important it is to draw it off in line with the shaft because it ain't going to come any other way. Yep. Oh, this is really working. Brilliant. Uh, that's it. Yay. That's it. So is something like this easy to get hold of? The, the pool, obviously the chain, people have chains. But yeah, but the, the tool, I mean, you're going to find the tool in any garage or workshop. It's, it's just a question of using your loaf a wee bit and putting the two together to make it work. Yeah. Oops. Yay, Oops. good job. Oh, I can certainly see why it was difficult to get off, all the rust around there. Yeah, you can see the rust around the woodruff key yeah. and the shaft, so you can see why it took so much forced to get it off. This is our wing and it looks like we are going to be able to salvage it, which is absolutely brilliant because it has the original aluminium grips here at the front. Now, okay, it is going to take a bit of work, as you can see, but that's fine. The problem I'm going to have is with the bonnet, but this is a dilemma you constantly have to weigh up when you're restoring tractors. Do you put in the effort and restore the authentic pieces? Do you go out and buy new pieces affecting the value of your tractor? Or do you start to search for authentic, decent second-hand parts? And if so, where do you begin your search? My search for a replacement bonnet begins with a man who owns these beautifully restored tractors along with a great deal more which are waiting for the same loving care and attention. In his day job however, Bertie Dunlop is always on hand to advise and share his vast knowledge at Dunlop Tractor Spares. You're obviously somebody who is passionate about their tractors. Yes, very enthusiastic about tractors from I was so high. Uh, in fact, I was uh, on the seat of a tractor before I was at school and if my father had any uh, anything to do with it I probably never went to school I would have just helped him at the farm but I am very passionate about tractors. Uh, it seems that enthusiasts whilst they may be very passionate about tractors sometimes you do have to weigh up when you need a bit of help or if you're going to maybe restore an authentic piece or go for a replica I mean, there's, I'm finding there's all these dilemmas that you constantly need to assess and weigh up in your head. Yes, uh, you're always faced with the, the problem, do I buy a new part or do I fix the old one? Yeah. We would have uh, people on a regular basis calling us up and, uh, for instance, a boy would ring us up and say, what price is a bonnet for a 1C5? And you would give them a, an approximate figure. And you would hear a sharp intake of breath at the far, far end of the phone. And uh, I would say to him next, then, are you sure you need it all? Could you not repair some of it? Yeah. And in some cases, boys would, well, perhaps I could. I could repair this part. Maybe the top part might be all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they could just get off with new sides, new grills, and, and a new bottom panel. And... Uh, repair the old top and they could save half of the price of the bonnet and have uh, 
an original bonnet. Uh, we could look at the, this tractor here as an example where welding was done on the rear mudguards. Those, those rear mudguards could not be bought. We couldn't source them anywhere for that age of a tractor. Yeah. This particular mudguard has uh, a unique overlapped seam here. That, yeah. and uh, The new mudguards you buy now don't have that and, and this couldn't be got. So this was the original mudguard that had holes down here that had to be cut out and the patches welded in. Yeah. Also, uh, the two struts at the back that comes up to support the, the mudguard mm -hmm. were completely gone. Whenever we were looking at this here, you could have moved the mudguard out and in a few inches. So we had to cut away the, the box in at the back here and uh, set in, make a new box and set it in mm -hmm. and tidy up the wells so that anybody looking in as we are now couldn't see anything uh, that had been replaced. The finished job was absolutely Excellent. first class. And you had no choice in the matter because obviously you couldn't get a replica for this so That's you right. had to put in the effort to, to do it but if it can be done here it can be done at any uh, time that, really. That's correct. Uh, I think a lot of replacement is unnecessary yeah. uh, although it is in many cases but in some cases it would be unnecessary. There's a bit of time and effort and patience. And sometimes a professional. A <laughs> and a professional. Take for instance this nose cone and this Super Dexter. Yes. These particular panels are not without work but that's an original but it had a hole in the side here where the, the two panels were overlapping mm -hmm. and the rust had got in. There was a, same on the other side too but this side was the worst. You could have put your hand right on through. Yeah. Uh, the hole was so big. We set a piece in, edge to edge, welded it, buffed down the welds on both sides, overlapped it in the same way as it was done before, and shaped it round. And you couldn't tell now, looking at that, where that, where that had been. Such a good finish. Although you can get replicas now, I still would fix the the original part and leave a job that no no man could ever tell had ever been repaired. Uh, as I look at that tractor, I can having the pleasure of thinking to myself that all the parts in that tractor are original. Now with my 135 I'm really lucky because I'm able to salvage the wings. Unfortunately with the bonnet I haven't been so lucky. Now my options I guess are to buy a replica or to search for a decent second hand one and if I do that where do I begin? Where do you begin the search? Well I suppose first thing would be search for a second hand one. Mm -hmm. um, you would need to be lucky to get one, but my advice would be to buy the magazines. There's plenty of magazines advertising parts, buy those and uh, have a look through the, the, the for sale ads there. Another good uh, avenue for searching would be the Friends of Ferguson Heritage uh, Club or perhaps even the, the Ferguson Club themselves. Yeah. I know a lot of good people in that and uh, they're very enthusiastic about their tractors and they know a lot of what's here and there. But a lot of it I'm hearing is maybe down to luck as well. I mean, if you're looking for the second, a decent second hand part. Yes, <laughs> there is boys lucky. I see them at the counter there uh, from time to time and it amazes me how lucky they have been to pick something up at perhaps very little money, Yeah. Uh, really just being in the right place at the right time or hearing of something that uh, would be suitable to them. And if you draw a blank, well, the only thing for it then is to buy a brand new bonnet and uh, they're available. They're not perfect and anybody that has fit at one will gladly agree with that. When you get the new and you still would have a bit of preparation before the the uh, job would be finished and smooth and level and uh, of course so even on a new level. one you're going to have to maybe pay you, a, bit, a bit of money yeah you're going to have to level them out a bit they're not particularly they're not particularly smooth they're made from new tooling and a lot of people don't know this they just seem to think it's maybe old tooling that's brought into service again so there's work if i buy a new one and there's going to be work if i source a second hand one if i can't restore the original now I think for the authenticity, I'm going to search out for a decent second-hand one and just expect a lot of work and keep my fingers crossed for some good luck. Well, you can be lucky. Uh, as I say to people, 
There's no 135's been scrapped nowadays. No man in their right mind would scrap a 135. So uh, you're looking for something that's been scrapped years and years ago and it's been sitting about. And you need to be lucky to find one like that. And it turns out we have been lucky. It's mad all this stuff is just lying about, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting to people who's interested in it. Myself and my friend Wilbert have made endless calls looking for a 135 bonnet. And believe it or not, we've been told there's one lying under the bushes in this farmer's backyard. Is that something that you're looking for? Oh, I can see Maybe. the 135 badge. 135, mm. yes, definitely. Oh, we'll left it out and have a closer look at it. Yeah. See what it's like. You take that. Oh, there. Have you got it? Sorry. Go ahead. Bringers and have on there. How it's and it's got the, your uh, head, your aluminium headlights and all on it. Oh, that's a good sign, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is. Aye. You don't have those in your old bonnet. Perfect. I don't have the middle part of the grill either. Right, so that's this is another bonus. <coughs> oh, you're flying. That so is uh, class. I love the lights. Aye. And, uh, that's that's reasonably good to see. What, does it tell it sound, sound enough? Yeah. So it is. Uh, it's sound enough. Good find. And the, the lead and the battery cover and all, you have all the bits and all on it. And then you have this here, that as well, and that's original. Great. And all, and very good. It's all, it's good, it's a good, a good straight, you know, not many dinges or anything yeah. on it. And then this is your battery lead. Yeah. That's, and all the hinges and all, the, this hinge here, this is a very, if, if you hadn't that on it now, I don't know whether you could get a replacement part for that at all. That's, that's the original hinge there for that. But if it didn't have that hinge there, the original hinge, like for such a small part, that could compromise the whole bonnet, so couldn't it? Sure that means that's, a, that's a, a real addition to it there, that there, and getting that there, and you know what, it's in very good yeah. you know, it's work, I know it's, it's spring loaded and all, that's another spring here, you see, the yeah. whole thing, it's just, it just makes a, a vast difference to the, to the bonnet, so it does, having that on it. And it's good we have the badge as well. Yeah, that's uh, the metal badge. They're uh, difficult to get. So you can replace this sticker bit here, bit, okay, but the, the original see, chrome badge. Uh, Brilliant. Mm -hmm. And you have your top grill and all here, and your badge bar, and all that. So I think you're very fortunate. I have the, these original wires and all on it, and the, the covers and all for your lights, which are very useful as well. Yeah, it's all more original mm -hmm. stuff. Brilliant. And all these bits here, those, all these rubber parts. That's quite a good bonnet. We're going to salvage this wing. We have these rare original aluminium hand grips, which is great. These are alien, so they're going to go. We're going to source original butler tail lights. It's down here that concerns me a bit because we can see it's fairly bad. It's pretty rusted. If I turn it around here. See the toolbox is perforated, but we'll get a better idea of the condition of this wing once we send it away to be power blasted. But before we do so, it's very important to remove these aluminium hand grips because the main body is steel, they're aluminium, so they use two different blasting methods. So that's what I'm going to do now. Now you may be inclined to go at it with this socket, but trust me, you're best not. You could shear the bolt, you could damage the aluminium, or worse still, hurt your hands. What you need is a bit of patience. If you go at it with a wire brush, what I'm going to do is try and scrub away a bit of the crud and the surplus rust that's built up over the years between the nut and the aluminium and that will make it much easier for the easing oil to get into the space as well. It's really worth taking your time with this. Quick spray of oil. So I've waited a few minutes for that to soak in and I'm going to go to it with a socket. Now I can't emphasise strongly enough, it is so important to invest in a really decent imperial socket set as opposed to a metric one. Now a metric one might look like it'll fit but there is a difference and you could end up totally destroying the bolt head and then you're stuffed. Oh yeah. That's come the way well fairly easily. And there we go, all the preparation was worth it. Job done. Well, what do you think, Molly? Impressed, yeah? Mm. 
In preparing the wheels for sandblasting, we need to remove the nuts and then tap the bolt ends to remove the centre. After blasting, this wheel centre will be repainted to the original red because I want everything about this tractor to be as original as possible. The wheel rims can now be sent to have the tyres removed before blasting. Well, I can't do everything. I'm just going to remove the exhaust here to give me better access to the fuel tank. Because we're going to drain the fuel out of it, it's obviously very important to do that before you do any welding or grinding or anything. So to drain the diesel out of here, we need to detach this main fuel pipe, isn't that right, Eugene? Yes, yeah? just take off that pipe. Okay. Yep. Right, that's it. It's come off of your fingers now. Yeah. Cool. When you get the pipe off, we'll pull it through to the other side okay. where the tap is. Grand. Okay. Thanks, Eugene. I think okay, I... you got it there? Yeah. Just pull it. That's it. Lovely. Oh, yeah. Jump Super. out of it. Ah. Yeah. There we go. Weave it over? Yep. Just, yeah. That's fine. That's enough now. That's okay. okay. How long should this take? Well, it depends how much fuel's in the tank. I guess there's about five litres in there. And okay. About five minutes will, will drain that out. What are these? Because there seems to be fuel in there too. Well, this is really all part of the fuel system. The fuel comes through the first primary filter, which mm -hmm. is a sediment bowl on the bottom to catch any sediment that may be in the fuel through to the second, secondary filter and it's filtered again mm -hmm. through this pipe to the fuel injection pump where it's pumped under pressure up into the injectors and into the engine. Uh, we need to replace these at some stage but not yet because we need to protect the, the system from blasting so we keep the old filters on until the blasting operation is complete. Mm. Then we'll replace them obviously with new filters. So while we're waiting for the fuel to drain we'll remove the dashboard. Where did it, where did the bolt go? It didn't seem to bounce very much, so it must be close. Oh, there it is. I can see it in there. Just, I can get a finger in it. Here, try this. Oh, brilliant. What is that? It's a magnet. Oh, I love it. This bolt comes out next. But before you do that, I suggest you take the grease nipple out okay. because it will allow you easier access to the bolt. Yep. We also want it out before blasting because these things are easily damaged. So we'll take it out now and replace it with a quarter UNF bolt. Okay, we'll put that in the box and I'll hold the, the rubber back for you and Get just it. carry on. That's it. Awesome. Lovely. Thank you. Cheers. A washer as well. Yeah. Two washers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've disconnected all the pipes, wires and leads, so she should come off now. Shouldn't okay. She? Yes, just carefully. Oh, it goes. Careful. That's it. Gently. Lovely. We've got it all in one there piece. Now, yep, I'll bring this wire with us. Now, the dash is a bit pitted, but it is salvageable. Some of the dials are original and some of them aren't, but we're going to keep all of them because to try and get original ones is virtually impossible. We're going to remove them all before it goes for blasting. We're going to remove the light switch here and the starter key switch. And I've just noticed the hours on the clock. 1,510 hours. Is that not remarkably low for a tractor of this age? The fuel has drained from the tank, so we can set about removing it from the tractor. Once again, we stick strictly to our labelling system for the nuts, bolts and washers. Okay, so you have the fuel turned off? Yes, I switched it off. And, and these got are these little pipes off here. They're detached, yep. And I have all the bolts off from underneath. Uh -huh. And you have the back bolts off, so yep. let's go gently up, straight up. Okay. Yeah. 
She's starting to look a bit naked now, isn't she? Yep. And there's more to come off. The radiator's next. Okay. <laughs> Coming now, almost there, I'd say. These are our wheel centers. Now, this has been finely shot blasted for the back and for the front. Now, we could have bought brand new replica wheels, but we didn't do that. We go to all this effort because these are authentic, and you can tell that by the details, like such as the wee rivets here. And such attention to detail has gone into these wheels. Look at the sealer here. And that attention to detail is all thanks to Danny and James. Hey there. Uh, what stage of the process are you at at the moment, Danny? Well, this wheel here has already been sealed the same as the front wheels there. Yeah. Uh, that's the stop of rust coming through, through you know, an aging process. Uh, it's all completely rubbed. I'm just finishing off the back of the wheel here. Uh, it was very rough, so we filled it up to smooth it out so as whenever the tube because then it doesn't cut the tube. Uh, James here, if you, if you have a look, yeah. uh, he's actually finishing off the, the process of the sealing. It's a lot of trouble to seal every joint. What happens if you don't do that? Well, if you don't do it through, through time, uh, in the actual wheel itself, the, the water gets trapped in here. It then starts to rust. Uh, your paint will start to perish. Then the rust comes through. Uh, because the wheels are actual silver mist, uh, with the rust sitting on top of the wheel, you know, it's noticeable from a great distance, especially the, you know, the brownie rusty colour on a nice bright silver. You just, you know, for 10 minutes work, I would save, you know, a lifetime of a hassle, basically. And that's why we do it. And so it's done with every single joint? Every single joint, yeah. Uh, the outside especially, and if you tilt it up a bit there, you'll see that it's done on the inside as well, because, it, you know, you have to seal it all. There's no point in yeah. a little bit. So, tell me, are you here to chat or work? Oh gosh, you are a hard taskmaster. I'm here to work, absolutely. Well, there's a sandpaper. There's a rim crack on. I just watch your nails there. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I have to paint these today, not tonight, so... Okay, sorry. That's better. <laughs> How do you work with them? <laughs> Sanding by hand, how come you're doing that and not like with a machine? Well, the palm sander, what you have there, you can see it's a, it's a large flat surface. For one, you know, you, you can't get it in all these edges here. Yeah. Uh, so basically all you do, you, you get yourself a, a sheet of sandpaper. The, the curves here on the, the axle edge of the wheel, you can be rubbing in this curve here. You can also put your finger there and that will rub, you know, it'll rub this curve down and all the way around. You're, you're killing all three curves in one, you know, one swoop. Uh, plus you're getting a natural feel for the metal too, and it, it keeps it, you know, original. I probably could have saved you and me a lot of work if I just bought, like, new replica wheels, but... Well, yeah, it would have saved me a while lot of hassle, but at the end of, at the, end of the day, you've got a weld mark in the centre of your wheel here. Uh, that, that weld mark... You know, if you buy a new wheel, it's not there. It's, it's completely different markings. Uh, you take the, the tractor to a show, you, you are going to lose points because it's not an original wheel. Uh, your, your edges as well are also rolled in the newer wheels, the replica wheels, whereas these are a flat edge. Yeah. Uh, and again, that would lose you points as well because it's, it's not the original. Uh, and it's nice to have them sort of original qualities about the thing. Absolutely. You know? Yep, that's what we want. <laughs> so keep rolling. Right, the stage we're on now, everything's sanded down. Uh, the metal works basically ready for painting now, yep. but because we've, we've been sanding at them and there's, there's been metal rubbed off them, there's dust everywhere, yeah. so we need to eliminate the dust. So, uh, crack on. Tell me if I'm being too fussy or... You can never be too fussy in this job. I like your thinking. Now we have to pre-panel wipe them. It's to take any grease or 
you know, oil or anything that's contaminants from our hands. Like if you've if you've rubbed your face, there's grease in your face, you contaminate the wheel with it. Oh, okay. Whenever we go to paint, then it's going to ruin the paint job. So we have to eliminate these problems first. So all you do is put onto the pump, pump it up. Once it's wet, you start wiping it on. You've got the dry cloth there, and you have to wipe it off dry. Dead on. And I'll just go in front of you. Go on ahead. You can't miss a square millimetre, because if you do, it'll show. It'll show when you paint it? If, there, if there's any oil or residue or stuff on it, it'll show through, you know, it'll, it'll bleed through the paint. Once the, the cloths are dirty, just discard them and use a clean one again. Yours is still clean at the moment. Yes. That's because you're not working hard enough. <laughs> oh dear, this is going to be a long process. <laughs> it is. Every restorer will have to employ the services of a power blaster. Eugene Dixon of Main Surface Finishing is the man for me. He demonstrates steel grip blasting. This here, Emma Louise, was steel grip blasting. Uh, basically because the mud guard was in such bad condition and a lot of heavy corrosion at this part. Yeah. And it basically takes out uh, any of the rust that's impregnated into the surface of the metal and as the best uh, media we could use to blast this with. This here is steel grip blast it, yes, at 80 PSI of pressure uh, to give this finish. Eugene, they say when you sandblast something, you can really see the condition of the metal. In this case, I'm not quite sure that's such a good thing. It looks a bit pitiful there. Do you think it's salvageable? Well, it has uh, received quite a bit from the blasting. Now, as you can see here, the blasting just exposed it. Yeah. Uh, now we have to uh, make some sort of an assessment as to what way we're going to repair this part here. Uh, possibly cutting some of it out and welding new panels in and then re-blasting again. W with the steel grit with again? The, with the steel grit again, yes, okay. to leave the perfect profile for the subsequent paint finish and film. So, Eugene, why wouldn't you just do the whole uh, mud guard uh, using steel grit blasting? We wouldn't use steel grit blasting on this part of the mud guard here because the material is quite light, yeah. so therefore we can cause distortion. On this here we would use either soda blasting or aluminium oxide blasting both at low pressures. So if you want, I'll get in there and I'll show you some soda blasting. Emma Louise, this here is the uh, soda blasting we've done in this mud guard. And the reason again why we've done this is basically to gently remove the paint and expose the underlying surface. And this here hasn't caused any distortion on the mud guard whatsoever. But there's no doubt the soda is far gentler at 30 PSI of pressure, uh, so it's exposed underlying corrosion uh, into the, the metal. But we'll now take this here back in again and do some uh, aluminium oxide blasting to gently remove this, this oxidization on the surface of the metal. So how come you wouldn't have just used aluminium oxide on this in the first place? Well, the, the main reason is for using soda blasting is to expose the surface so that you can make an assessment at that point as to how much blasting is actually required on the part. But in this case, where well, you can see the paint has broke through. So it's really investigative each stage. You're gradually working out the condition of, of the... Um, yes, that's, that's, that's correct. And, and now where we see this and this has been exposed, we will need to take this back into the blast room and use something slightly more aggressive like aluminium oxide to clean up these areas of rust here yeah. and remove them for the paint finish. Right, so there you go, this is the blast and now carried out with aluminium oxide at a pressure of 60 psi. And as you can see, this has totally removed the oxidization and rust on the surface of the metal. Uh, so now, basing on that there, we will now take this uh, mudguard back in again and soda blast first 
and then finish off with aluminium oxide for any corrosion. God, that's great. It is really smooth, isn't it? Yes, it, it is. It's a good finish, and it leaves a, a very good profile for the paint finish that's, uh, that it'll be getting after we've finished blasting the mudguard. Well, I didn't get dressed up like this for nothing. Can I have a wee go? By all means. Come on this way. <laughs> Oh gosh, that was immense. That is one of the coolest things I have ever done. Let's look at my handiwork. Yes, this is it here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got a job here, Emma Louise. Oh, do you know, it is really satisfying. You know, when you see just all the paint being blasted, stripped away, it's, it's, oh. We call it therapeutic. It is really therapeutic. And it just feels really cool. I think I got a bit carried away. I know you were maybe just after me to do the toolbox, but once I got started, it was like, oh, I have to do this and this. It's fine. It's an excellent job. Well done. Thank you. My wheel centers have a new look. What's happened here? Well, uh, after you tack ragged them, we put on a sulfate and primer. The sulfate and primer is what uh, initially holds the paint on to the, the wheel itself. Uh, it's the key for the primer. If you didn't put that on, through time, you know, be a couple of weeks, a couple of years, the, the paint would start to flake off. It's got no adhesion. This is what makes, you know, initially the primer stick to the wheels. Uh, it's, it's green in colour, but it's very, uh, it's like a watery substance. Yeah. Uh, and it's really sticky. Not too shabby, eh? That's okay, that's okay. Well, for a first attempt, was it okay? Not too bad. I have to, I have to give you... Eugene, you look like you are really enjoying this. Yes, I am. I enjoy tractors. That's my hobby, vintage tractors. When did you first get obsessed, I mean, interested in vintage tractors? Well, <laughs> I was interested in this type of tractor when I was five. In fact, when I was five, I was on a tractor in this very lane. Oh! Yes, it's over 50 years ago. So it's the whole nostalgia thing as well, isn't it? Yes, there's a bit of that in it, but I also enjoy buying tractors. I enjoy restoring tractors. I enjoy the challenge of making them run and making them look well. And I enjoy all the friends I meet who have tractors. Now, is this your pride and joy? Well, this is one of my uh, tractors. It's probably my favourite one because I like the way it drives. Uh, I like the way it starts. I like the way it, the way it runs. And I just like it as a tractor. Uh, this is a 1943 model but a really popular tractor when I was a young lad grow up, growing up around this farm. I like working with it. Sometimes I plough, sometimes I mow, and sometimes I just go for a drive. 
So that's great. You actually use your tractors, you know, for it's not just for, oh, it looks great. You know, you're actually getting out there and using it. Yes, and you'll often find my tractors with dung and mud on the wheels, and uh, they're really working, working tractors. I mean, you put in hours into restoring tractors and ordering parts, and it, it, it's, it's nearly, but it's more than a hobby. It's nearly like a career. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a real hobby, but it's a full-time hobby. I know people who spend hours and hours playing golf. I know people who spend hours and hours in the pub. I just seem to spend hours and hours fixing tractors. That's my hobby. I enjoy it. This is obviously my first time restoring a tractor. Do you think I'm a totally hopeless case or any redeeming things you have Certainly to? Certainly not. You're a, tri <laughs> you're a trier. You're a real trier. I, I mean, I've watched you over the last few days and uh, you certainly take an interest in what you're doing. You're prepared to accept advice and that's very important. If you're stuck, ask someone or get someone else to do it. And that's, that's what I do. That's what we all do. There's some stuff I simply can't do. I've got to get an expert. I wasn't even fishing for a compliment there. Well, not half, well, but you that's can not work too bad. That's a compliment or not. <laughs> yeah, true. Mm. You need a lot of help. Uh, yes. <laughs> all enthusiasm, no skill. That's kind of what you're getting. Well, do you know, seeing you drive down that lane and obviously the pleasure and the smile on your face, you're like a kid, you know, and I, I can. That's what I have to, you know, keep in my head. I can see it's all worth it when I see the enjoyment you get from it. Yeah, it's always good to have a focus and have a, a, an imaginary picture of your finished tractor at the end and just keep focusing on that all the way through and it'll get you there, believe me. I might need to borrow the hat, though. Well, the hat goes with the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> you get yourself a tractor and you do it up. You're bitten by the bug, so you might get yourself another tractor. You may even diversify and begin to restore a vintage car or a 1959 police water cannon. You do know we're going to go for a wee spin? Yes, get on, let's go. Okay. This is cool. Good fun. <laughs> really good fun. Remember we found an oil leak in here. The oil leaks from the rear axle into the brakes. Now to fix that, we have to remove the brake shoes and the assembly. Uh, we remove the back plate. We remove the, the half shaft along with the hub. Is this a big job? It's a biggish job, but I mean it's within, well within the capability of the average enthusiast. And to start, we go back here and there's a little set screw in here on the, the brake activating shaft. So we're starting to get this little set screw here. It's coming out nicely now. Out it comes. There we are. Okay, we're taking the springs off. A good pull. There we are. Now we can remove these hold down springs. These hold the brake shoes to the back plate. Give it a turn. Off it comes, the spring, and the back washer. Okay, now it'll come off in, in one piece. Here we go. There we are. Okay, so next we take off this row of studs around the, the back of the hub. The trouble with these is there's so much paint and rust around them that the socket were just to get a socket in, so we'll stick with the spanner. Okay, we're ready to remove the, the back plate along with the hub and the half shaft. Now, it might come, but I have a feeling it's going to need a little tap at the back. Yep, tap. That's all. Nice steady, steady pull. Here it goes. Okay, here, here it comes, gently, gently. There's the half shaft. Brilliant. We'll turn it up on its end, like this. Okay. Okay, we take off the, the shims first. There should be two, maybe three here. Just 
to. And take off the back plate. Right, we're going to remove this oil seal that's in at the back here. But in order to do that, we have to remove the bearing. The bearing's in here and the hub from the half shaft. First, we've got to remove this collar. Yeah. This collar is pressed on uh, at manufacturer and it's pressed on very, very tightly. Of course. Uh, when it was manufactured, so we have to get this collar off. We put it in the anvil nice and firm. We put a chisel on the face of it and we give it a good blow or two with the hammer. What does that do? What we're trying to do here is to spread out the, the collar and loosen it so yeah. it slides off right up the shaft. Okay? I'm guessing you're not going to need that collar again? Certainly not. Hmm. This one's finished. Okay, one final one. Let's see if it moves. Yep. Oh, we're, good. we're in business. Lovely. Okay, just. Fantastic. Okay. There it goes. Cool. You can take it off. I well, that, oh, okay. Right off. Okay. So we, we took the collar off here, uh -huh. off here, right? You see the, the, the whole hub moves freely in this direction, but I'll never lift off. So even with the collar off, we still can't get it off? Certainly not. That, that's mm. been pressed on, and it really needs some, some help to come off. Is this? What is this? Well, this is something I made yesterday. It's, uh, it's really a modified pillar. All it, all it consists of is a flange, a piece of piping welded to it, four holes, and a screw at the top. Brilliant. Works, I, I love me. your secret yep. machines. <laughs> In order for Eugene's special gizmo to work, he'd earlier removed all but four of the studs from the hub assembly. Yeah. And screw it right down to the very top, nice and flush. We're looking for a nice even pull on the hub so it all comes off nice and, nice and smoothly. Mm. That's okay. So I'll tighten this here, tighten yeah. this screw, and that will push the shaft right that that direction and, and bring the bearing along with it. See? And you should see Yay, the... Yay! It's moving, See yeah. it's starting to move out? Yep. Brilliant! It works. This is an ingenious wee <laughs> device. I suppose when you're doing this type of project, it is good to think outside the box when it comes to wee inventions that will help you along your way, so to speak? Well, it's difficult to find the right tool sometimes. So you really have to mix something. But I mean, there's nothing ingenious about this, really. It's, anybody can make it. Honestly? Yeah, it's, uh, you find it. Make it from a few pieces of scrap that's lying around the workshop. Yeah. A welder, a drill, and uh, really that's all you need. I, I think I can feel the pressure going off it. So yeah. if you give it a little push there, you'll find that oh, okay. it'll, it'll come out. Okay, it's coming. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, good, good for you. Just pull it on out a little bit. Okay. Good. Great. Lovely. Good. Lovely. That's it. Works well, quite heavy now. Go ahead. That's it. You just put it down in the workshop? Leave, leave it on the bench. In the meantime, we'll have a look at it. Okay. Let's get the bolts off and. Just Take it out and you'll see. Okay, I've ah. got the bearing here. It's fallen out, see it? It, it feels okay. It looks in, in good condition. Excellent. I think what we'll do first is we'll, we'll give it a good wash with paraffin oil, then pack it with new grease before we refit it. That's great. We can save this. Okay, let's look at the hub here. And here's the oil seal. Uh, that's the troublemaker. That's the troublemaker, all right. This causes the oil to leak out into the brakes, spoils the brakes, so we're going to take it out and replace it with this nice new one here. It is unbelievable that just this one wee small piece, we had to go to so much effort and such lengths. I mean, would most restorers go to such efforts? I'm not sure they do. In my experience, uh, most people that restore tractors don't, don't go this far. Mm, I suppose for peace of mind, well, it had, yeah, it had to be done. We're going to do it right, aren't oh, we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> 
So we've cleaned the hub with paraffin. Now I just give this light taps at the light back. Light tap, yeah. okay, yes, it's fine. I think that's stubborn, so just keep going, you're in. It's coming now. Yep, that's it. One or two more. Lovely. Sweet. Got it. Here we are. <laughs> Good show. There it is. That's the culprit. Dirty rat. Yep. I love this yeah. cam. It reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, you know, the Tin Man. But yeah, just put a wee just tiny drop there. here. Okay, and just drop that right in. Okay, leave it down something soft. All right, you want to make sure it goes in nice and plumb. That's mm -hmm. it. It's nice and even right round. Yeah. Okay. It's a very complicated piece. This it's an oil seal beating in contraption. So it's a piece of wood. <laughs> it's not. It's an oil seal assertion tool. That's what it is. <laughs> Easy. Lovely. It's going nicely. It's going nice. That's very good. When reassembling the half shaft, the bearing will need to be pressed on using a vertical hydraulic jack. By using a mild steel tube longer in length than the half shaft, Eugene's able to apply constant and even pressure on the bearing. When refitting the collar, Eugene uses a blowtorch to heat it red hot. This is a term known as sweating. That means it should tap on with ease. So we've another seal in here. Yes, this is the inner, the inner oil seal. It's part of the problem that's given us bad brakes. Uh -huh. uh, the oil leaks out through this into the brake drums. So we'll take the old oil seal out and fit a new one. There we go. There you are. Here's another tool for you. It's just a, a hooked pair of pliers. So if you just take it in there and, and lever, it, lever it out, up, mm -hmm. up and out easily. That's it. Yes, that's it. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. That's it. You've got it. Spanjax? Yeah, Spanjax now, all right. But you can see why it has to be tight to hold the oil back in here. Yeah. So it's got to be a real tight fit. When we fit the new seal, it's important to remember that the, the lip on the rubber part goes towards the oil and the axle. There we are. You've got the heavy bit. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to try and line this up for you here. Great. I'm lined up here, yep. Yeah. I'm in now. There it is. There we are. Yeah. Lovely. That's it. Excuse me, Molly. Excuse me. Back. So when you're doing that, I'll fit the, the brake drum. There we are. And we won't replace the brake shades until after we blast it. So that was a good day's work, wasn't it? Great. Not bad at all. It's tomorrow. We're not <laughs> out of the woods yet. <laughs> So the steel grip blasting has really shown up how bad this toolbox is. I mean, it's bad. In fact, it is beyond reasonable repair. So what we're going to do is cut them out. In fact, actually, when I lift it, you can really see how bad it is there. So we'll cut those out. And if you come over here, we have bought shiny new wings. Voila! But we're not going to use these. Oh, no. We are just after the toolboxes. So we have cut them out. Thank you, James. 
and we are going to fit them to the original wing. Now, is that a fairly good fit, James? Well, considering that these are donor uh, toolboxes, it is actually quite a good fit. So we shouldn't have any great difficulty in attaching this to the original wing. Brilliant. So, and then what's next after that? The next stage is on the original toolbox, there was a band of steel ran the whole way around the outer of the toolbox. Mm -hmm. So the donor one doesn't have this. So we're going to propose to attach a piece of metal steel flat bar mm -hmm. around the outside of this toolbox here to try and keep this as original looking as possible. Definitely, keeping it authentic. Yep. But do you know what I do notice? This original toolbox has these strengthening ridges. Um, I mean, is that going to be a, a big problem because obviously they're not in the donor? Well, the donor one, as you quite rightly said, doesn't have the strengthening ridges, but this part here is actually still quite sound. Yeah. So what we're going to try and do is snip out this part here mm -hmm. and try and offer it into here and weld it in place. Is that going to be worth it, do you think? Well, to keep everything as original, yes, it is worth it. Well, that's what we want, so that's what we'll do. Okay. The mild steel flat bar is easily bent when heated to fit round the shape of the toolbox. Because of the, the way the donor toolbox has been manufactured, there's a, a gap here along the corner. Mm -hmm. But we still can fill that there with weld. Cool. And it'll still, it'll still be okay. You want to have a go? Why not? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, James, what do you think? That's very good. Very good. Honestly? Yep. Uh huh. Woohoo! Oh man, this rocks. I'm pretty pleased with that, actually. Oh. It's Another new skill. <laughs> no, that's very good. That's well done. I was expecting it to be worse, but it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was expecting it to be worse as well. <laughs> Just stripping my second hand bonnet here. I've already removed the grill. So far removed one of the badges. These are priceless. And just working on the aluminium lights here. These ratchet spanners are worth their weight in gold. Our original aluminium light now, the lamp in here isn't an original, it's been replaced with a Lucas. Our original would have been Butler's England. Now, this actually came from the other light, which is a total result. Of course, the problem now is I've got to find another one of these. It's not going to be easy, but you know what? We'll manage it. Now, the other light's been soda blasted. It's less aggressive than sandblasting, but it's what you do when you're working with aluminium. So you can just see the difference there. So what we'll end up with is our two original lights both with butler lamps. Okay, nice so if the, the corners is all welded now, so we're using a not a traditional grinding disc. This here is a, a multi-flap disc, mm -hmm. which is 80 grade in this case. So it's a nicer finish. Oh, it's a great smooth finish. Isn't uh -huh. it? Nicer finish. It doesn't leave the deep gouges on it the way a grinding disc would. So yeah. it's, it's better for for appearance. Fab. So that's what we're just going to polish off all the wells now.
James, I can see when people are restoring tractors, why they might have just gone for a whole replica wing. Because I know you still have more to do, but th there's so much effort has gone into this. Yep, definitely. But we're still not even finished yet. We still have these areas here to cover yet. And of course, the box has to, has to fit. But you're happy enough for the moment to, to attach the box? And yep, I think we're ready to see how it, how it fits here and put it into its position. Yep. I just have to make sure that this line here remains straight because this part here, remember, was cut away from the original toolbox. Mm -hmm. So once we get this here spotted in place, then this here will be welded in again. So yeah. we have to keep this here straight and it makes contact down at the down at the toe of the box here. So there is a slight uh, a slight gap here, mm -hmm. as you can see down the, the far side here. Yeah. There's just there's a difference in the profile of the cut of the the toolbox to the existing wing, but we still can we can work with that there. That's achievable. Okay, so the toolbox is spot welded into position there now, but I just want to check one thing. I just want to check it over the body to make sure that it looks okay from the other side. Very precise. As you can see, this is where the original spot wells were that hold, held on the, the old toolbox. Mm -hmm. But we can use them to our advantage now. We can weld through these here to attach the wing to the, the new toolbox as well. And sand them off flat again. And then renew our panel in at the bottom here, up into the existing wing here. So we're halfway there. Gosh, there's still so much to do. There is. And you have two wings, you still have the other one to do. Another man with a lot to do is Danny, our painter and panel beater extraordinaire. The second hand bonnet, which we found under a bush in a scrapyard, may have had all the original parts, but it still needs a lot of panel beating before it ever sees Danny's paint shop. Well, that's, that's a bit straight. Yeah. Now we need to get this bit massaged into place because it's, it's jotting out. Yeah. It's actually down the way. So, what we're going to have to do is put, is put the dolly as close here as we can yeah. as possible and start tapping here and this will bring it down and then we'll do the same, we'll flick it over there, tap it down a bit and we'll just massage it into place, okay? Okay. <laughs> Now you need to come round this side. See the way you've got it at an yeah. angle? Yeah. Right? You need to come round the other side and then hit more, oh, concentrate more here. on this side. And it's, it's starting to shape in nicely. This is one of those things, it's like I thought it would be so easy, but it's just... It, you're not, I'm not seeing anything happening, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's it annoying. It is a slow process, uh, but then I'm used to doing it, you're not, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, it just takes time, a long time unfortunately, but once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. Do you want me to fix this wee bit and we'll move on to our uh, for you? Please, because I think with like the welding and grinding, you see an immediate effect or something, you know, yes. whereas this is, oh, this I don't think I have the process. patience. <laughs> before. <laughs> You've given the game away. Yeah, I've done it before. Right, you'll see here, Emma Louise, we've got a dent in the way, mm -hmm. okay, like something that's fell under the tractor or some other mishap. Now, we can get the dolly onto it here to try and beat the dent out, Yeah. okay, but unfortunately, I can't get the hammer in at the back yeah. to hammer it up the way. So what we can do is we can spot weld a wee rod on here. Cool. 
and pull it with a panel puller. Do you want to do that? Yeah, signed. Okay. All you have to do with this here is, it goes on like that, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever you push it down, that's how it gets its arc. This ring here actually touches the metal, and then this bit glows okay. and welds that onto it. So you just put it down like that and spark it. Okay. okay. Yep, push it down so as it's flat on the metal. Okay. Okay, and then just press the trigger. One, two, and take it off. three. Lift up. And just lift up. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Right. Now that we've got our rod on, Emma Louise, mm -hmm. we need to get this on. This is a slide hammer. Yeah. Okay. You tighten that down, it's on tight, okay? There's two ways you can do this. Yeah. You can either hit it like this, right, which is going to pull the metal up. Put it up. Because we're close to a curve here, Emma Louise, if I sit and tap it up like that there, it's going to pull that into a straight line, which yep. we don't want. We want to keep the natural curve in it. So if I hold it up and put pressure whilst holding the bonnet down, and you hit around this area here, you'll see it rising up okay. a lot quicker than what the, the other bit did now. Okay? So if you want to go on ahead and start tapping, just gently, yeah, about an inch round from it, okay. it'll start to pull up. Around this side more too? Yep, yeah. yep. Just take this off and have a wee check. You can see there, there's still there's still a very very small dent left left behind, but it's coming into shape nicely. So we'll hit it one one or two more hits yet. Mm. Very nearly there, just here. Very nearly out. Right, now that we've got the rod removed and we've ground it back to flat, you can see here there's still a very small dent. Yeah. Okay, right, we're going to use this dolly mm -hmm. because whenever we put it onto the curve, it matches in nicely. Okay? Brilliant. Okay, and what I'm going to need you to do is hit it from the inside until it, it pushes the dent out for us. Paul coming out. It is indeed. That's good enough. I mean, that wee dent took, well, took me a wee while to get out. How long do you reckon it'll take you to do the whole bonnet? Uh, to get it ready to go into the paint shop for a coat of primer after it's been blasted, uh, probably four days. Four days? Four days, yeah. Cheekers, it is so labour intensive. You can see why people would just go out and buy a brand new bonnet. Well, that's, that's the easy option and that's what most people choose to do, but we want it original, so that's Absolutely. what we have Absolutely. That's what we want. <laughs> It feels like everything has just ground to a halt. I know it hasn't, but when you're stripping the tractor, you've all the excitement and you get these instantaneous results. Whereas at the moment, everything is so slow and laborious and there's just so much to do. It is completely overwhelming and seriously scary. And I have to say, credit to the guys who are doing the, the work, the experts who are, are doing each different separate task. Uh, they're doing a phenomenal job and they're the top of their game and I know I will be pleased with the end results. But we're just at the point where everything's just so gradual and laborious and you need just bucket loads of patience. And I don't have that. Um, but I know it will be worth it and I know I'm doing this because I will be able to stand back and be so proud because we will have restored this tractor to better condition than it was originally. And that will be amazing, and that's what I have to keep in my head. <laughs> Clearly, I need a shot of enthusiasm from somewhere. So I go to my first ever tractor show to see what other restorers have achieved.
I finished restoring it about five years ago, and I can recount that because I gave it to my wife for her 10th wedding anniversary, and oh. we're, we're 15 years married now, so it's bound to be five years. Is so your wife named Valerie? Val Valerie Morrow. It's her tractor. I'm lucky she's letting me take it out and show it. Oh, she's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Worked at it for about four years. Um, I just done it as the interest took me, and then you get you get the periods where you get stripped in, and then it lies flat for a while. I can so relate to that because just there's so much to do. It, it's mm -hmm. it's got to the point where I've kind of I've dipped a bit. It's like oh, it just seems it's never going to get done. You, you need a wee bush to get it going. But I have some brochures, and you can buy DVDs on on tractors and stuff now, different shows. So you go to shows, you look at them. You sit at night in the house and you open up the brochures and you look at the brochures and you see what this can turn out like. So that gives you a wee boost. You look at the brochure and think, I get that there. You keep that image in your mind. You keep that, that image in your I'm mind. For. And that, that's what you keep going for. Robert, I am so impressed. And you're only 16? Yeah, I'm only 16. When did you begin the restoration and well, how did it all come about? Well, I've always been interested in vintage tractors since a very young age. And three years ago, I decided I'd buy a vintage tractor and I'd have it ready for whenever I get my license at 16 and I can take it to the Garva Horse Show. I saved up for two years. My ambition since the day I bought it was to get it to the Garva Horse Show. And I got it fixed, finished it about two weeks, two weeks ago. I polished it last night and uh, the man painted my name on it. And, the pride's immense to see my tractor sitting here as well as any of the other ones. Robert, what was the most challenging part of the whole project for you? Well, the most challenging part was probably getting the engine fixed because there were so many oil leaks and there was so much trouble given with the engine. It took a long time and a lot, a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of waiting around and new parts to come. But eventually we've got it. We've got it here today. So. Well, congratulations. Honestly, that is so admirable. And you're only 16 and you've done this and it, the finish is brilliant. Now this I recognise, a 135 just like my own, but I'm kind of at the stage where it all seems so daunting, there's so much to do. So I cannot imagine what it must be like to do a beast like this. Well, when you restored the 135 and the 188, did the 188 take a lot longer? Considerably longer because uh, some of the fact that it's more rare, so the parts aren't as easily available. And, uh, the four-wheel traction that's on this tractor wasn't a Massey Ferguson uh, original item, it was an, an added-on item that could be purchased and parts is harder now to, to find for it. And why are you so passionate about restoring tractors? What is it about it? I don't know, I think I just started and it just, I think it gets, it just creeps up on you. And you get one then they think you want another and it's a wee bit addictive I, I think addictive, isn't it? Addictive that's the word I It's nice getting all the original parts, that's what you're looking for. And it becomes a hunt for them. And, and, and that hunt for the original part is good fun. And it's nice whenever you get that bit, you cherish it, you bring it home and you think that's a wee beautiful. <laughs> Emily, is I here, you're doing up a tractor. I absolutely am. I'm doing up a Massey 135, and fingers crossed we're, we're going to just get over this wee difficult bit. And, and I just have to keep seeing the pride that you yeah. have and, and seeing how happy you are with the job you've done. And, and I think if I keep that in my head, that'll see me through. I brought mine here after a year, so I expect you to have yours here this time next year. Gosh, no pressure then. <laughs> Sure, it's only right that our wee mate Robert, he's only 16, he gets to lead the parade. Well, if Robert can do it, so can I. I guess I've got to stop feeling sorry for myself and just get back to work. And maybe I'll be able to show off my tractor at next year's show.
My most mechanically minded enthusiasts should be able to handle the spindle shafts here at the front and the half shafts here at the back. Moving on to the hydraulics, if you have a problem with your hydraulics, you're going to have to remove this lid and you're getting into the whole hydraulic system here. Most people are going to realise that they're going to have to ask for some specialist help because that's just... We, however, know, thankfully, our hydraulics are fine. We tested it before with Wilbert. Now, we do have some wear on our hydraulic cross shaft here and our lift arms, so we're still going to have to remove this lid. Now, that may seem like a daunting task. However, it's going to be made much easier thanks to one of Eugene's wonderful gadgets. Before we use the hoist, to lift the lid off, there's some things we must do. Otherwise, we can cause serious damage. First of all, we're going to remove this lift arm. There we go. I have the other one off on the other side. Great. Okay, the next thing we must do is to remove this cover plate to out the two studs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we remove this cover and the tape should come up with it. Yes, and there it is. Okay. Now, if we didn't take this out now, we could probably damage it when we try to lift the, the lid off. Right, you get it out now. Well, we've got it out. Good. There we are. Next, we need to take away the response control plate. And that allows us access into the side of the hydraulic system. So we move this little plate first. Scary. Do we really want to go in there? Well, <laughs> if we're careful and we're watching what we're doing, you'll find we'll come out the other end intact. That's what it's all about. Okay, and there's the, the plate. Okay, there's a few studs to come off here, but we have to make sure, first of all, we took all the oil out. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, it would be a real mess coming around us shortly. And there's the, the plate. Before we take the lid off, mm -hmm. there's a little thing in here, it's a valve actuating roller mm -hmm. that operates the draft control. Yeah. It's very small and it's very fiddly but, and there's no room in here, uh, so we need to be careful taking it off. You can see here this little piston uh, is trapped as long as the roller is in position. If we don't take it out, we can cause some damage when we lift the lid. We don't want that. We don't <laughs> want that. And here we go. I've just got it now, and here we are. How did you know about that wee bit? How would other restorers know that that's such a vital piece to take out? Well, I suppose you'd consider me more of an enthusiast than an expert, uh, and I think the point needs to be made that I'm prepared to ask people that know like Wilbert Crawford. I'm prepared to go and study carefully the, the workshop manual yeah. and just, uh, it's, it's really a sort of a self-learning process. Yeah. I'm not prepared to go out of my depth. I mean, I don't do things that I'm not capable of doing. I'm quite comfortable to, to deal with thing, things like this, having sought advice or having referred to a manual. You could really have done some serious damage if you hadn't known yeah. about that and tried to yank it all Sure. Out. If we leave this PP piece in, inside and lift the lid off, we're that doing piston and yep, yeah. hundreds of pounds of the damage. Oh, yep. yikes. Scary, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I had your knowledge. <laughs> 14 studs to come out, 14 bolts. Yep. So the handbrake just moves forward and sits like that, there. Okay. Okay. Great. These four bolts don't come off because they're, they're holding on part of the hydraulic system underneath. Okay, just start lifting. Emma Louise, please. I'm doing it gently. Yep, keep it going. Lovely. That's perfect. Perfect. Lovely. Keep it going. Up you go. Go ahead. Keep it going. Keep lifting. That's it. Up. Keep it going. Up. Lovely. Right up. That's it. That's enough, thanks. That's okay. Stop there. Okay. Lovely. Great. So there you are. There's the hydraulic system. 
and I can also see why I would not be going near it. It looks quite scary. <laughs> yes, but there's a couple of things when we must do. There's a, a little plunger here, this one, yeah. and we're going to tie that down with a piece of wire so that when we turn the, the whole system uh, upside down, it won't fall out. We can change the filter here. This filter looks very, very clogged and dirty. So when we have the lid off, we'll just fit a new filter. We're not going to do much else in there. Mm -hmm. It's really a job for an expert. But anyway, we don't need to do it. The hydraulics are fine. Great. OK, and you can see why we, we took the lid off to get this shaft out. If we didn't, all this stuff would fall down into the, the bottom. Oh, yeah, nightmare. Yep. And I can see why you tied this V piston on, obviously, because it would have fallen off when you turn it over. Yep, and there's, there's not just a piston there, there's a spring and there's other little, little bit, bits and pieces in there. that. All <laughs> these we, wee tips. There's you know. us with a challenge to put together again. Mm. It's moving. Good. It's coming out, isn't it? Yep, perfect. Okay, lovely. Just take it all lovely. out. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Okay. Voila! So, we have a new replacement shaft to fit. And while at first it looks identical, all is not as it seems. Looks identical, doesn't it? Yeah, but not quite, because the shaft's got one hole oh. to hold on the, the, for the bolt to hold on the lift arm. The old shaft's got two holes. Oh, gosh. Now, let me have the washer. Okay, so you can see that we put the new shaft in, it's going to look like this, yeah. but it's not original. The old shafts got this washer with two holes, mm -hmm. so we need to modify the new shaft with two new threaded holes to accept this washer. Then it looks original. So you are telling me that people would come along, and if we were to use, say, the, the um, new washer, yep. they would come along and they'd say immediately, oh, all right, this is an original, let's pull yep. that. Yes, of course they would, and it's not original. We want to keep our tractor perfect and original. I know we do, but it's like extremes. Oh. Yes, but that's, it's not easy. It just takes time and patience and effort. Gosh. So this is obviously a problem that faces loads of restorers. Obviously not just with this part. Presumably you have to modify loads of different parts because they just don't make them as they were once were. Yep, yep. And we're going to find other parts in this tractor that, that need modified. Brilliant. Yep. That's something to look forward to. Oh. So how are we going to get these bored? Well, that's a job for a precision engineer uh, because we've got to make sure that these holes are precisely bored where they should be uh -huh. and thread it to accept the, the bolts. So we'll take that off to an engineering shop and get that done. Okay. Now, we can't continue on with the hydraulics at the moment because the cross shaft is away having holes bore into it. So we're going to move on to splitting the tractor. Wilbert, I remember when I first was chatting to you, we had our initial assessment and you mentioned to me this idea of splitting the tractor and I was totally overwhelmed, completely daunted. You see at this stage, I think I've seen everything. Nothing surprises me. However, I think the sensible thing to do is still to leave this job to you guys. So, um, yeah, I'll just uh, observe from afar. Work. <laughs> right, we're taking all these, all these studs out right now and that's what holds us together. Yeah. Are these all bell housing? Yeah. One of their bell housing. Yeah. You see, I am helping, even if it's a very small way. Now, we're splitting the tractor because we want to get into the clutch. Yeah. Yes. And the rear oil seal. See it coming out? Yeah. There you are. Oh, yeah. There we are, that's the, that's that bit completed. Well this here is the, the, the clutch here and these are, these are called fingers and there's adjusting screws in, on those and if they get out of line she doesn't release the, the, the PTO shaft when you put the clutch down. Yeah, which is... Just which is this, outside, this outer one, yeah. this, the bigger one. That's the PTO shaft there. So those have to be taken off and put a, a tool on them to set them set them all at an equal distance. Yeah. Now, when we have her split, there's a thrust bearing on here. Can you see it in there? See this here? Oh, yes, yeah. There's a wee roughness on that. So yeah. Rather than put her together 
and then at some time later on, I have to split her again to put that in. A few minutes, I put that there in. So when we have her down, we just do that there as well. Great. The rear uh, crankshaft oil seal, I want to replace that because remember the first, there's, there was oil yeah, leaking, leaking from out of here, down here. Yeah. And that was the oil coming out of the back of the engine and then dropping onto the ground. And that's, we'll get that there and when, when we last here off, we get into the seal. When we get the clutch off, we find that the clutch plate was stuck to the flywheel, which confirms the oil was seeping onto it from a damaged crankshaft seal. You can see it. You see the oil there, around right that there. It's all just covered. The oil soaked onto it. And once the oil gets onto that, that's it. Finished, it? Finished. Oh, if your clutch plate is sticking to the flywheel, your tractor won't stop when you put your foot in the clutch. This is called carrying the clutch plate. And I suppose if you were working hard with this tractor, that would certainly happen. It's going to spew out more oil on oh, the clutch, uh, and then mm -hmm. definitely she won't stop when you put the clutch in. No. Nope. Yeah. So when you would take the price of that plate, this here is worn as well. There's a, the wear is the most important thing on that there. That's for that. That's damage there. The wear and that there. This plate is worn down into this. That runs. That, that is worn down in there a bit. There's another clutch plate here in the middle. That's contaminated with oil as well. Oh. And the, the, these springs need replaced. That there, there's a bit of wear in that there, that, that plate. I don't know whether you can see it or not, there's wear in that yeah, plate. So That's moving back and forwards. That there, that plate is moving. Oh yeah. There's moving in that. And then there's these screws here. To, too, like. You can see it there. It's worn more than that one, and then that makes it uneven. No, it's all badly. So are there, these going to have to... Those, we have to replace those. On the other hand, you can buy a whole complete unit. When you have to replace so many parts in the old clutch, Better buy a new unit, and yeah, it's just ready for there. something, just for going straight on. Would that then sort out our PTO problem? That sorts out your PTO problem because these, these are the new screws here, adjusting screws. And they're all those are all, ready to be adjusted. Are ready to adjust it, just ready to stand. You have, you have to buy those. You have to buy those fingers will be worn as well. Yeah. The connecting links there. Yeah. The whole thing. It's just you better. There's no point definitely. about it. Just definitely. I would advise you anyway. What is the point in us buying all the different components to take time and effort and work when we could just buy the, the one? False economy. Yeah. Yes, so that, that's, you, want, you want a new unit and that there. That's it. Definitely. Without I think a doubt, without a doubt. If, so. if it's sitting there complete, mm -hmm. that's our boy. Yep. That's, that's it. To get at the crankshaft seal that's causing the whole problem, we first take off the flywheel and then remove the studs from the seal housing. Does that whole disc there come off? No, that's the end of the crankshaft. That's the, the pistons. Try that round, round and round. That makes the whole thing go. There's a boy one day, his car broke down. He had the bonnet up, looking at it. This boy comes staggering up. What's the matter? What's the matter, boy? <laughs> and the man looks up and he says, piston broke. And the boy says, oh, that makes two of us. That makes two of us. That makes two of us. <laughs> Piston broke. Very good. Piston <laughs> broke. Right. Even with the studs removed from the housing, you'll find that you won't be able to get into the seal until you remove the flywheel housing first. Okay. This is the boy here that was causing all the trouble letting the, letting the oil out of the engine. Mm -hmm. It's only a, a wee rope seal. Oh, yeah. Not there. That's, that's what... There's one of, the, one of those in the bottom and the other goes in the top. You had to split the tractor, take off the flight, the clutch, take off the fly wheel, take out that, uh, <laughs> to that wee that. thing there. It's, and it's pathetic. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, putting a new one of those in, it'll cure the oil from going into your, the bell housing of the tractor and then dripping onto the ground. And then this is the There's other half. half. And they both sit over the end of the, the crankshaft, the back end of the crankshaft, like that there, yeah. to form a seal. After a full day's work, we have the engine and the gearbox rejoined. Now this seal was worn and letting oil into our clutch assembly, so we replaced the seal, we replaced this gasket, and we ended up replacing the entire clutch. Now while we were at that, we took a wee look at our starter ring gear. Now it's starting to show some wear. It might last another few years, but we thought while the tractor split, better to replace this now. And we replaced the bearing in the flywheel. 
Now, when you replace the clutch, you also replace the thrust bearing in the bell housing here. And when we took out the old one, it gave us access to replace the very worn clutch pedal shaft here and bushings, and also the brake pedal shaft and bushings down here. Why would we go to all this trouble? Because whilst we want our tractor to look really good, we also want it to be mechanically sound and drive as well as it did when it came out of the factory over 40 years ago. I suppose I'm fairly unique in that I'm restoring a tractor and I have never, ever driven one. Now, nobody was mad enough to lend me a sparkling, gleaming, restored one. So they've lent me this bad boy. And who else would I have along with me but my good friend, Wilbert? You're going to show me how it's done? Hopefully. Oh, good, me yes. too. <laughs> right, hop up. Okay. To see how we get on. Right. Right. First thing you have to do is make sure the two gear levers are in the neutral. That's halfway mm -hmm. between back and forward. Just put onto that one there. That's yeah. it. And then that's that neutral there. The other one's the same. That's it. That's that there. Okay. That's okay. Make sure the stopper's on. That's it then. So I'm guessing that's pretty important to pull out when I want to stop. When you want to stop. Pull to stop on that button there. Yes. Grand. Okay. So if you turn the key. The most important thing to know about is your braking system. Yes. So the foot brake system here. Okay. This is these two brakes pedals are locked together, but this thing here, this mechanism here, you you can use them individually. If you're working on the farm and you want to make a quicker turn. Oh, cool. Using one brake. That's like right, the handbrake turn thing. Like the donuts <laughs> job. Donut job. But when you're on the road or Anywhere else, you, you keep them locked together so you can break both wheels at one time. Okay. It doesn't matter what pedal you touch. Push on your, push on your stopper. Starter. That's the idea. That's the other. Cool. Okay, it is slow, but I'm driving a tractor. <laughs> this lever here, that's the same as your accelerator in your car. So if we start the tractor, if you start the tractor again, just okay. start her there and let her run a minute now. Start her up. Now, if you put that there back, put me that back to hear the difference. One back. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, one yeah. Back, one back, one back, one back. That really is me. I've graduated top of my class. No more 135s. I've moved on to the monster that is the Massey 1150. Now, from never having driven a tractor to getting onto this like massive, massive tractor, it is immense. I've done pretty well, haven't I? You've done very well. You've done very well. You're an excellent driver. Oh. Very confident, anyway. Oh, thank you. Now that I've got to drive a tractor, I am determined that the next one I drive in will be my fully restored 135. Better get back to work then. We're back working at the hydraulics because we have our new hydraulic cross shaft back with the freshly drilled and tapped holes. So I can discard this old one. Because we're going to fit this one. Okay. Yeah. I'll we'll put the, the bushing on first, just with a little oil to make everything slide. Uh -huh. Slide easily. Some oil on the outside as well. But just makes it that little, little bit easier. Yeah. 
Okay, so the vision goes on at this end here, mm -hmm. up to here, all right, and we start and present the shaft. Now, it's, it's a matter of lining up the ram arm with the shaft mm -hmm. and feeding it through like this. We get it on, on the splines like that, right, and it's, it's ready for a little tap. We'll fit the, the bushing on the other side. Right. Happy enough with that. So this is another little tool we have for uh, driving bushes in or out. This fits in the inside the bushing, and the the edge catches the the edge of the bushing, and it just puts it in nice and square. So it doesn't damage it at all. It doesn't damage it. Simple. Brilliant! Another yep. great gadget. <laughs> See it? Yep. yep. See it there? Not so it's flush on this side. Yep. It needs to come out the length of the spline on that side. Okay. And this bushing needs to, to move in. So Go in more. a few more mm -hmm. taps. Oh yeah. Coming. Perfect. Well, nearly. I'd say that's us, nearly. And we're there. And we need to tap in the bush on this side as well. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. That's you. Yeah. We can put the rubber seal on next. Dead on. And we'll fit the lift arms after we refit this uh, lid to the tractor. We're ready to put the lid back onto the hydraulic housing. Now we change the oil filter way down there. And this is why. Look at that. So banjaxed. Um, now the underside of the lid is already greased. And we're going to just grease the top here. And yes, we are using grease as opposed to some of the other modern compounds available because 40 years ago, they would have used grease. So that's what we're going with. And this will keep the gasket soft and make it all seal better. Here's the gasket. We're just going to put this on over these guide bolts. And we're using a gasket because, again, that's what would have been used traditionally 40 years ago. Before we put this down, I have to tell you, we've taken off our quadrant plates and levers just from here. These are going to be sent away to be cleaned and gold passivated zinc plated. Have you got that? Gold passivated zinc plated. Thank you, Jean. Are you going to maybe guide it in? Will I do the controls? You yeah, can try I'll it. do that. Try on. <laughs> okay. Lovely. It's nicely lined up. Very gently down. Okay. Very gently. Onto the, onto the guide bolts first. Gently this at the time. Okay, down. Let's get close to it now, just a minute. That's nice. Keep Still it going. A wee smidgen. Lovely. Gently that's it. God. It's a bit jerky this machine, isn't it? It is, because I'm barely Go ahead. turning it. Keep it going, that's it. Oops. Oh. Is that it? We're there. You remember we took this little piece here out? It's a, a valve actuating roller for the draft I response. Do. Remember this piece because here? It's tricky. <laughs> okay. Well, it's got to go back in again. We're trying to get that, that, that piece in there mm -hmm. into those holes. But if it falls down in here, we've got to take the lid off to find it. No. So it can't fall. <laughs> no. It just can't fall. I won't call this one of my best inventions. <laughs> uh, it's just simply a piece of masking tape to hold it so that if it does slip, we can retrieve it and, and have another go. It's a good tip. Oh, right, yeah. So we don't have to take the lid off again. Phew! 